Welcome back to Powerhouse San Pedro and our Sunday recap. Today's focus is New Year's resolutions. But first, did you know that a single spaghetti noodle is called a spaghetto? Did you know that otters are known to be monogamous animals who hold hands when they sleep in the water to avoid floating away from their partners and family members while resting? Did you know that it took 75 years for the telephone to reach 50 million users? It took the radio 38 years. It took television 13 years to reach 50 million users. And it took the app Angry Birds only 35 days to reach 50 million users. Did you know that you're less motivated to succeed when you know you have a backup plan? The safety net makes you likely to work less hard. Did you know that the human brain contains 2,500,500 gigabytes of storage space? That's what they say. All these did you knows are brought to you by they, because that's what they say. New Year's resolutions. Have you ever made a New Year's resolution that fizzled out in just a few weeks or even a few days? If you have, you're not alone. It's discouraging to start a new year with high hopes, with new habits, only to fizzle out within a couple of weeks. New Year's resolutions are good to have. It's good to pause and consider goals. However, before you decide what you want to do or accomplish, it's important to ask yourself, what am I believing? Goals and resolutions won't work if your beliefs are sabotaging them. Steve Backlin, the author of Igniting Hope in 40 Days, says that as you raise your beliefs, it will shape your choices, which will change your behavior and empower you to accomplish the goals you are aiming for. It's as simple as believing you are capable, and then you're more likely to give it a try and succeed. What you believe about yourself, others, and your ministry will be a determining factor as to how high you are able to go in the end. What would it be like if we didn't put limits on our lives, but instead raised our beliefs to the standard of heaven? With God, there are no limits. As you launch into this next year, embrace beliefs that are in line with the heart of God and watch as the fruits unfold in the days and months ahead. This process is called repentance, aligning our thoughts with God. An easy way of remembering this process of repentance is found in the breakdown of the word re Pent. Re meaning to turn around or go back to. Pent as in penthouse, the room which is on the top floor of a building, or in this case, it would be the highest way of thinking, which would be aligning your thoughts with God. Turn your thoughts to the highest way of thinking, repentance. So let's put this into action. What beliefs are you choosing in 2022? Take some time this week or even today to listen and write down what the Holy Spirit shows you about beliefs that you have of yourself, beliefs about your family members, beliefs about your colleagues and friends, beliefs about your ministry, work, and schooling, beliefs about your year ahead. Ask yourself, are there any areas where I need to raise my beliefs higher? Then declare each morning your New Year's beliefs. As you speak them out, they will ingrain themselves into your spirit. Another part of moving forward is remembering. Remembering the things that God has been teaching you. If you briefly look back at 2021, what did God show you? 
Do you remember? Last week, I began to try and remember those things that God showed me last year. And I couldn't remember a lot of them until I looked back at the past YouTube videos and my highlighted notes. And then I remembered. And this reminds me of when I traveled with Frank Gonzalez and the Freedom Sound many years ago after I graduated from high school. I remember sitting down at the end of the tour with the other teammates and we were trying to remember the things that had happened that year. And we couldn't remember many of them. Until Rick Anderson pulled out a calendar that he had used to write down key happenings throughout the year. And then we all remembered. We remembered and began to share priceless memories of miracles that happened. We remembered miracles in prisons and in plazas and in backyard services and open air meetings and multiple sized church buildings and public schools, private schools, and even on an army base. We remembered that one evening when we were in a Guatemalan church. And as we began the service, we began to hear bombings and sounds of like fireworks in the background. And what was happening was that the country was being attacked in guerrilla warfare that night. And all the power went out. And no one seemed to panic in the church. Instead, a few ladies got up and went to the back and got some candles and passed them out to everybody. And then got a lantern and gave it to Frank Gonzalez and said, would you continue and preach. So he did. And many gave their hearts to the Lord that night. All while in the background, you can hear the bombs bursting around the city. Months later, we returned back to Guatemala, and this time it was peacetime. There was a new president, and this president invited us to give a private concert for his family and his cabinet members in the presidential palace. I'll never forget the words that the president of Guatemala said to us in attendance. He said that night that this was the first time the message of Jesus Christ had stained the walls of this palace in the history of this country. We remembered when we were in three prisons in just one week. And not only did people give their hearts to the Lord, in all three of those prisons. But in all three of those prisons, the wardens gave their hearts to the Lord. All three. All three wardens came forward to receive Christ as their personal Savior and Lord. And they stood among the prisoners. I remembered a service we had in an army base during the wartime in Guatemala when 200 soldiers stood to invite Christ into their life. The officers later mentioned to us that all of those soldiers would be going into battle on the front line the next few weeks. I remember the time when we had an outdoor evening church service, and at the end of that service, there was a very well-dressed man standing waiting to talk to Frank Gonzalez. And this man was not part of the local gathering, but he had traveled quite a ways to get to that service. As he spoke to Frank, he spoke of when he first met Frank in the team. It was years ago when he was in prison. He said that Frank and the team had come to prison where he was, and he em emphasized how much he couldn't stand them being there and couldn't wait for them to leave. But he said that Frank and the team came back the next year. And then again the next year. And it was that time that he responded to the call of following God. And upon his release from prison, he continued his walk with God. At that time, he introduced himself as the pastor of the church that we would be going to the following week. I remember one late night while traveling across Latin America, we were stopped at the border where everything came to a halt. It was in the early morning hours when this incident happened. I was the designated person to keep the driver awake that evening or that morning. 
we had come up to the border and it was as if the border was closed. I was the one that walked out with Frank to talk to the border control officer. And this officer said to us very clear, you will not be crossing the border until the following Monday. And it was Thursday or Friday that morning. See, the problem with not being able to cross until Monday was that we had many scheduled services that weekend across that border. The officer was emphatically telling us over and over that we will not be crossing the border until Monday. As the border control officer spoke those words to Frank, he handed back Frank the paperwork and he said, come back Monday. As the officer turned to walk away, I noticed Frank saying these words, father, change his mind so that we can go across the border. And as soon as he said those words, the officer turned around without breaking stride. He walked up to us, put his hand out for the papers. Frank gave them the papers. The officer signed them and said, go ahead. <sighs> A miracle. I remember one hot afternoon in Latin America when we had set up our stage in the middle of a plaza. The pre-service music was playing as usual and people had started to gather. Everything seemed as normal as before. 10 people came, 20 people, 50 people, and maybe 75 people had gathered. What seemed like it was going to be just a normal afternoon concert became something that I'll never forget. Because that afternoon something happened. A miracle. The power went out. You see, the music stopped and the people began to walk away. At that point, I figured that the concert's over because no power means no amplification and no amplification means no concert. Frank then turned and said, boys, I want you to pray. But I thought, pray for what? I mean, pray that the people would come back. I mean, the people had already walked away. I, be, I prayed, but then I began to, to think of ways that we can get people to come back. Like maybe if we shouted or we sang loud, or maybe we took our trumpets out and started playing and, and, and people will come. We continued to pray and it just seemed like it got later and later, like too late. And then all of a sudden something happened. In the middle of us praying, the power came back on. Well, I was thinking, hey, we don't have to pray for a miracle anymore because the power's on. Soundtrack started up and began to play, but I noticed something different. You see, those people that had left seemed to come back, but not just them. But this time, four to five times more people than the original number came back. So we had a concert that day in the plaza. And on top of that, people responded to Christ much more than we would have had in the original setup. We later found out that the reason that there were so many people that gathered the second time was because as the whole town was out of power, we ended up having the only power in town. And the memories go on and on and on and on. During that tour, I had also heard God speak to me for the very first time in my life. You see, I grew up in church and remembered hearing people say things like, well, God told me this and God told me that and God told me this. And I would, I would always think, how did God tell you? I mean, how does God talk to you? Does, is it out loud or what? I just figured that only spiritually elite could hear God, of which I was not one. Until that one particular week in Latin America, when I needed an answer from God. I needed to know what to do. So I asked God. And I even told God how to answer me. I said, you know, you can give me a sign or you can give me some kind of a, a, a lightning bolt or a, a tree falling over or something. And then I began to tell God how not to answer me. 
because since this was my first time hearing from him, or it was going to be, I didn't want him to tell me in my head or in my mind because I would think that it was me or something else. I wanted to be clear. I didn't want to guess. I was tired of guessing what God wanted. I needed to know for sure what God wanted. I prayed and I fasted because that's what I heard people say they did when they were serious. So I did. I prayed and fasted for a day and then two and then three and then four. And I began to talk to God and say, God, I'm not going to eat until you answer me. If you're not going to answer me, then I'll die. I'm not, how brave I sounded, huh? But actually, uh, it was a very painful time. It was a crossroad for me. Because I wanted to hear from God. And then that day happened. At the end of the week, God answered me. And it wasn't through a lightning bolt and it wasn't through a tree falling over. It wasn't through writing on the wall. He let me know by the simple words that somebody had spoken to me. And in those words, God said, that's me. And I knew that I knew that I knew that I knew it was God. I just knew it. I, I can't explain how. I just knew that it was God. For the first time, I knew what God sounded like. And it wasn't like I thought. It wasn't this beaming voice from heaven. It was in my thoughts. But somehow I knew for sure that it was him. You see, the answer that I needed was whether I was going to stay and travel another year with Frank or I was going to go home. And I was the last one to come up with that answer. And so I needed to know. And so I asked God, God, what is it that you want me to do? Do you want me to stay in another year? Do you want me to go home? And that afternoon, God answered me. And his answer was this. I want you to go home. Well, I finally knew what I was supposed to do. And I was so ready to go tell Frank what I had heard. And so I waited until that afternoon and that evening we were getting ready for a service and, and Frank, it was behind a church and Frank asked me, he said, so do you know yet what you're going to do? And I said, yes, I do. And he said, well, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to go home. And he said, well, how do you know that that's what you're supposed to do? And I said, <clears throat> God told me. And he said, I think you heard wrong. I said, what? He said, I think you heard wrong. And there was silence. You see, normally I would just back off and question myself. But for the first time in my life, I knew that I knew that I knew that I knew that it was God that told me the answer. So what did that mean? What do I do? And then it dawned on me. If I knew that I knew that I knew that I knew that that was God, then that means Frank Gonzalez is wrong? How can that be? You see, this was a man that was the closest to God that I've ever known. How can he be wrong? But I knew what I heard. I had an assurance and a confidence that I'd never had before. That day, Frank Gonzalez became a man and not a heavenly being visiting me from heaven. He wasn't immortal. He was a man. But for some strange reason, I did not question myself. I think it was the next day that Frank came up to me and, and he spoke these words. He said, I was wrong. He was admitting that he was wrong when he said and when he questioned about me hearing from God. And then he told me why he said those words. He said, because I wanted you to stay another year. 
and my answer was my flesh saying that you were wrong when I knew you were right. That day I witnessed what a true man of God was. You see, Frank fell off the pedestal I had designed for him. But instead, I learned what a humble man of God was like. Something that I have and will cherish for the rest of my life. And I have used that moment and that picture as a model of what I want to be like. A true, powerful, humble man of God. I learned many things that year. And I've learned many things since. I began to think what would happen if we here at Powerhouse began to track what God said to us. I think we would end up realizing the great amount of things that he's pouring into our lives. I recently looked at a list of Powerhouse episodes of this past year. And I realized that God was showing us, teaching us, training us for a reason and for a purpose. He had a plan and that plan involved preparation for the next season of great things that were about to happen. You see, our memories are limited, but what if we could do something that would enhance our memory? What if we could actually remember the things of God? On Sunday, I pulled out the YouTube video thumbnails of the many episodes of what God had highlighted and uh, throughout the year of 2021. And we sat there and reminisced and began to recall the things that God was, had shown us. We realized that God had been reforming our thinking to think like him. We learn how to insert the truths of God into our lives by practicing them over and over and over. Things such as trust and faith, and hope and rest. We learned that laughter and joy is a choice and not just a feeling. In 2021, we learned how to position ourselves for victory. We renewed our thinking. We learned more on how to wait on the Lord while inserting trust and faith and hope. And we learned how to exchange weariness for rest. 2022 is going to be about having more encounters with God, like many close encounters. So bring a notebook with you next time. Because we want to track everything that God is showing us. I want to encourage you to join us regularly in 2022 as we learn to experience his presence each week. We want to begin this journey by writing down such things as what am I hearing? What am I learning? What is God saying to me? We want to write those down right then and there. I would love to hear your responses each week, if I could. As you watch these weekly episodes, please like, subscribe, and comment below so that you won't miss anything that comes from our Powerhouse Hub. If you would like to send a pleasant comment or question to me directly, you can do so via email at church at powerhousesanpedro.com. Let's together refocus our picture of what God has shown us so that we can see clearly what he's going to show us in 2022. Let me close with this thought. We can sometimes think that we have a good grip on understanding the things of God. But what if there is more to the picture? What if there's more to what we already know? What if there's more details in the picture that we haven't seen yet? I liken this to binoculars. Most of us that use binoculars, when we use them, we use that center focus wheel to focus them so we could see clearly. Did you know that the optimal way to focus a pair of binoculars is to close your right eye, concentrate on the left, and turn the center focus wheel until the image is in focus. Then close the left eye and adjust the right eyepiece by turning it until the image is in focus. 
Many people don't even know that that right eyepiece moves. And that is how you focus binoculars to get optimal viewing. In 2022, let's look at clearer pictures of what God is saying to us and what he's showing us. And let's do it together. Why not? Until next week, whether your problems come from the east or the west or the north or the south, God is with you. Thank you.